collecting cars. If you're looking to build up your personal collection or need teardown cars to build customs, you've got a few routes to go down to make some purchases. The first, obviously, in this day and age, is the internet. It's not always as satisfying as picking up a car in person, and it can be harder to aimlessly browse around, but you can find anything and everything. eBay for older cars, dealers for new cars that you might want to reserve. It can be cheaper, but of course the downside is that you have to wait to get them shipped. So if you want to buy in person, you've got three options. Choice one, retail diecast stores. Back in the day, the late 90s into the 2000s, these were everywhere. You could go into pretty much any big store, you'd find diecasts on the shelves. There would be places in, in malls, pretty much anywhere there was NASCAR merchandise. And then the big NASCAR boom sort of died down. Uh, the big rift and a big split in the manufacturers. There was the death of Dale Earnhardt, which turned a lot of people off. And the whole industry just took a big hit. I think that marked the beginning of the end for retail stores, plus the internet, so they're harder to find these days. You're a lot less likely to find them in shopping centers and malls than you used to. The best suggestion? Do a Google search on maps to see if there's any near you and what their hours are. They might be limited and the location might be somewhere you wouldn't expect, like in an industrial park. And choice two, flea markets. There's big indoor flea markets. Might not have thought about that one before, but especially if you're after older cars or great deals, I've had good luck finding tables and shops inside some of them, be it someone slowly selling off their whole big collection or someone new that's dealing with modern cars. But the single best place to pick up cars today is at the racetrack. If you've been before, you know what I'm talking about. When there's a weekend that involves the Cup Series, all kind of vendors roll into the track. The got the official team merchandise haulers, ones that sell mixes of all the drivers, there's dealers, booths, sponsors doing promos and giveaways, drivers doing autographs, there's a ton. So if you're planning on going to a race, show up early, bring extra money, and take a look at the whole carnival. Printing decals. Okay, so I looked online and I found this NASCAR logo, which I'm going to use, put it in Photoshop, print it out of my fancy decal paper, cut it out, and apply it to the hood of this car, which for the sake of this I'm just going to leave blank. But something's not right here. It looks transparent. What happened to the white of the logo? It disappeared when I took it off the backing paper because the only white was on the backing paper. This leads to a problem that you may not have ever thought about before. For most of you watching this, your printer can't print white ink. The white that you see when you print anything out in color is the white of the paper. There isn't a white ink cartridge. You can't make white out of any other color. Now, some printers do have spaces and capabilities for printing white ink, but if you're not sure whether or not your home printer does, let me save you some time. It doesn't. You would know if you did, because you probably bought it specifically for that purpose. They're rare. Before making this video, I asked around every print shop in my town to see if any had a white ink printer, and basically got laughed out of the stores. If you want to use one, your best bet is to either buy one, like an Alps printer, which will cost you hundreds of dollars to take some maintenance, or find someone else who does. There's always a chance that a local print shop may have one, but I doubt it. Or you could try going to a hobby shop that deals in model cars and things like that, and ask the owner if he knows anyone that comes through the store that does. It can be worth a shot, because these are without a doubt the best tools for making and printing decals. But if you don't have any access to a special printer, you're not completely out of luck. I don't have one, and I've managed to skate by so far, but with some limitations. Other than the special paper that you'd use for a white printer, I'll call it the blue paper, you can buy packs of decal paper that has white or clear backing. At the most, these will cost a few dollars per sheet. Now comes the part where you gotta get real creative. Every car has white somewhere on it. For cars that are any color besides white, use white decal paper. Areas that you leave clear when printing the sheet out will stay white. That might sound good, but unless you want to spend hours cutting out each individual piece, you're going to have to go in and fill in the blank area around the white in as the color of the background of the car. So for this car, I outlined each decal in black. White cars are easier. If it's your first time building, pick one with a white base color first. You can use decal paper with clear backing, and anything that you leave white or blank comes out clear. The white that you'll need will be on the paint of the car. Ignore that this one's all damaged up. I'll get to that later on. Now I'll show you how to go print them out the right way. First of all, turn your printer off, just as a precaution. If it's too hot inside, there's a small chance that the decal paper could get gummed up and really mess some things up inside. But the most important problem to worry about is what kind of printer you have and what kind of paper you have. 
There's different decal paper for inkjet printers and laser printers. So before you go ahead and stick paper in, be sure what kind of printer you have and that the paper you have is matched up with it. Back in Photoshop, I'm going to go to Print and make sure that you're not scaling it to fit the media. Keep it exactly what you see on the screen and use the rulers if you have to. Now page setup because we need to specify what kind of paper we're printing here. It is going to be a little different. If it's on unspecified, choose an option like color laser transparency. The paper you buy might even suggest on the label what to use. And once the printer's cooled down for a few minutes, I'll put my sheet of paper in, turn it back on, and as soon as it says that it's ready, hit print. This all may not have been the best way to get it done, but for you, it's probably the easiest and cheapest way to print out a few decals without stepping too deep into the whole world of printing and getting it over your head. Here's a few tips for avoiding wasting any of the paper. Before you print out your final sheet, do as many test prints as you have to on plain black and white paper to make sure that you have all the pieces sized and lined up right. And once you do, and you have a final product, fill up the page with as much as you can. You might be able to fit two cards worth on one sheet, or have enough backups of any tricky pieces that might take more than one attempt to cut out and stick on. I hate having to use a whole extra piece of decal paper just for one or two things that I messed up or forgot about. Now, designing your own decals, once again, there's a couple of ways to go about this. There's easy cars, like this one from Chad Hockenbroth. Websites like Yahoo and NASCAR post previews of some paint jobs that look like this, a flat side view of the car. To make my sheet, I copied the left side, reversed everything to make the right side, and then filled in the bumpers and roof with other contingencies that I found online, all while comparing it to pictures of the real car. Same idea with the Mason Mingus car here. I found a picture online, a photo of a side view of it, and deconstructed it and reversed everything, looking for logos online to complete it. If you dig around enough online, like in places dedicated to posting paint schemes, or team and driver websites, you might find full previews of the car's artwork. These will be the easiest to make decals out of, but if it's a design made by somebody with copyrights, and maybe they say, you know, not to reproduce it without the permission, it might not be a good idea to go and start making and selling these cars left and right. And also, as another warning, never make anything that Lionel or the other diecast production companies have made or are making. If you've got a design for a car and you see them announce that they're going to release it, don't sell it. It's a great enough legal area as it already is, so don't push your luck. And if you really can't find the artwork anywhere online for a car that you want to build, if you're real polite, you can ask the race team and the scheme designer if they can send you the art. Sometimes that's even a good way to start up a business deal. There's also the whole world of sim racing, which can give you templates to design your own cars. Me personally, I don't follow any sim leagues or play in them myself, but if you want to go that route for design, there's plenty of websites out there dedicated to it. They'd be better resources than I would. Arca Cars The Arca Racing series isn't always known to be a monument of great paint jobs. Of course, that being said, you still see some good ones, and the odds are no one's making them. It's very, very rare that a diecast company produces an Arca card. Lately, it's just been when a guy like Chase Elliott or Ty Dillon comes through. It doesn't mean that you can, though. One big advantage that you have in price is that the Super Speedway cars that the teams use when they run at Daytona or Talladega are models of older generation combination white cars. Meaning they're cheaper to get your hands on than something made just in the past few years. These Grand End Finger cars I made are on bodies from, I believe, 2006. The main difference between NASCAR cars and ARCA cars, Hoosier tires. ARCA runs Hoosier, which NASCAR hasn't done since the 90s. Now, you can buy one of those rare ARCA diecast, and it'll have Hoosier tires on it, but like I said, they don't make many of them, so they're expensive. And oftentimes they're autographed, so you can't even make a custom car using them. Solution? Make or find some Hoosier decals and black out all of the Goodyear markings on your current tires with a Sharpie. Here's the same car, before and after. One sixty-fourth scale cars. Most of the ideas in the previous video that I showed you on customizing a large car carry over here, all except taking it apart. Whereas the big cars and trucks have screws, these all have rivets holding them. You can remove the rivets with a plain old hand drill, but if you have access to a drill press, that'll make the process a lot easier and safer. It's all about keeping the car in the drill bit at a constant angle over it. I keep the car in place with a mold, which in this case is 
actually just the styrofoam packing from an older car. These are the two visible rivets directly underneath the car that are going to have to get drilled out first. Before I do anything though, I'm going to wear some safety goggles just in case some metal shards come flying up. Now I position the drill bit right over the rivet and slowly lower it in. Before long you can already see all the little metal pieces flying up and shooting out of it. It's doing less damage than it looks, so keep going very slowly. Stop and clear all the metal off of it. I've got a little container here that I just dump all the dust into. Zoomed in closer, you can see that it is making a dent downwards, but there's still a ring around the outside that has to get pushed inwards. Once I've drilled down some, and I think that I can see a lip that can be peeled away, I'll use the metal picks and try and push it outwards. It's easier when you're not looking through the camera and you can bend in close. Now after I've done that, drill a little bit more, and let's see. Yep, loose enough. You can pop the front out. And then I'll repeat the same process for the back. Eventually I'll be able to pull the whole bottom off, the interior piece comes with it, and we see we've got a problem. There's more rivets on the inside, label them 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It seems to occur at random, but in certain cars, I don't have to drill out 1 and 2, I can just pry the plastic off and out with the pick. But they do all need to go. Even more so than the two exterior rivets, go very slow. You don't want to overshoot it and drill straight through the body of the car then it's worthless. But even after doing this dozens of times, I've only ruined one car this way. It's all about patience. Do try and make sure that after you've ground down the rivet enough for the piece to pop out, that you've done it in a way that'll make it possible to pop back in later. Test it out a couple of times. After that, the painting, decaling, and finishing process is the same as what I showed you in the previous video. While I'm painting, I give a shot of black to the window net area to make it look a little more realistic. For some reason, they're all manufactured gray. And since making the first video, I've started using this paint spray box to make painting indoors and in bad weather a little easier. There's a fan and a hose to direct fumes outdoors. Not a bad idea. And one more thing. When it comes to gluing the car back together once it's finished, you can use craft glue for most of the missing rivets, but use super glue for the final two underneath that hold the whole thing in place. These are also a good way to see whether or not the person who made the car put any time into it. Here's a pair of custom cars I bought that were made by two different people, other than myself. The first is the better example, and you can see underneath that the car was taken apart that there's glue where the rivets used to be. It's pretty smooth and shiny. The second car, not as good. It looks like the whole decal is just one big sticker over the whole car. The front bumper is starting to peel away on its own and the rivets are still in place, meaning the whole thing was never deconstructed. Damaged cars. Once you've mastered how to build a basic car, you can take it a step farther and start tearing them up. There's been some big crashes lately that people have turned into die-cast models. I know that at least a couple of different builders have tried their hand at the remains of the car that Kyle Larson flew into the fence with at Daytona last year. My first attempt was of the car that Parker Kligerman rolled over this year during testing. It'd be too costly to make a whole nother new one to show you for this video, so I'll take you through how I did mine. First off, there's a fork in the road between cosmetic damage and actual structural damage. Cosmetic damage is easier. You can just take sandpaper, paintbrushes, uh, anything to deal a little damage to it. Physical damage takes some heavier tools, depending on where you want to inflict it. Clickerman's car had the whole front end ripped off. On a piece of solid metal, I'm not going to be able to cut through it with a pair of scissors. And even for making metal bend, it's going to take more than a hammer to deliver any kind of finishing blow. A saw might work, but to really make the metal curl and bend at my will? Fire. Taking a blowtorch to it. I put the car in a vise and held the flame up to the nose of it until I could start to see the metal wilting and bending. I didn't expect it to be as soft as it was. All it took was one tap from a hammer and the entire front broke apart. From there, I did a few more shorter sessions of heat to let it bend and mold a little more, then waited for it to cool and filed down the sharp edges. After the frame is damaged enough, then I'll paint the car and put the decals on. I clear coat it just enough so that sandpaper and filing and scraping won't peel the decals back off. Then once I'm done the cosmetic damage, finish it and reassemble. 
And that's it. I think I've taught you everything that I've learned myself so far. You've seen it done the easy way, so now go out and build yourself. It's a lot of work, but it can be a lot of fun.